structures in the upper airway. Or just yell them out, whatever.
but they're very common. They're very much the same procedure. That's a real Back up and right. right. My right or their right? <laughs> that was a good question. Um, okay, uh, clarification. The uh, pinky size on the ET tube for pediatrics, um, that's diameter, not length. Okay, I wanted to clarify that. On, on that note, mm -hmm. external diameter, internal diameter. External diameter. Mm -hmm. What are the posterior cartilages? will be anterior, posterior, to the retina, anterior. anterior. So when you're looking in an airway, they'll be up from the retina. The retina will be below the port. And I'll show you good pictures of those. Can you say that again? The, the, it'll be when you're looking anterior. in the airway, your uh, retinoid cartilages or your posterior cartilages will be directly below the vocal cords. I've got pictures of them later. Okay. Uh, okay. At what point does the um, cartilaginous rings turn to smooth mus muscular rings? Anyone know why it's more common to right main stem versus left main stem? Which um, which lung has two lobes? What is the function of having the lobes separate, or having separate lobes? Is there really a, a difference in, like, in a, in a collapsed lung? Like, yeah, certain lobes. Can one lobe be... just collapse and the other one still be inflated? Yep, all the time. For injury to one lobe, you've still got functional other lobes. You see that with puncture wounds all the time. Okay. The, with the, the muscular rings, that was at the secondary bronchi? Right? Nope, right after the carina. Okay. It's the primary. Okay. As soon as you're in the bronchus, you go from trachea yeah. to bronchus. And, and right away, mm -hmm. right at the carina, right mm -hmm. after the carina, it goes to muscle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Okay, differences in pediatric airways. Very Shorter. Um, a big one that's not on that list is the occiput, too, that their head's different shape. So uh, in order to get them in a good airway management position, you have to put a roll under their shoulders. And I'm sorry I didn't include that in that uh, table. Um, their tongues are bigger. I don't know if somebody said that. Their teeth are really small, softer, mm -hmm. even if they're not um, out. They're yeah. Still yeah. Good. What's the smallest part of an adult airway? Vocal cords. Vocal cords or glottic opening, <coughs> same, same anatomy, two different terms. Is there a better way to, uh, that's called the sniffing position, right? Yep. Is there a better way, to do, or is there a way to do that if we suspect a C-spine injury? Or is there anything about that? <coughs> um, not really. Yeah. But anatomical, correct anatomy gives you a semi-sniffing position because of the curve of the spine. <coughs> Um, but that's when the job dress comes in, and we'll talk about that. And when you're elevating, about how much up or how much you elevate the shoulders? It depends on the kid, and you don't want them hyperextended. You just want, uh, just want them in good alignment. So it just depends on the kid. Okay, moving on. <coughs> Respiratory physiology. So there's a difference between respiration and ventilation. Respiration is the exchange of gases or the diffusion of gases at the lungs and at the tissues. So you can have cellular respiration. Um, it requires an intact circulatory system. And ventilation is the mechanical process of getting air in and out of the, the air shaft, the alveolar. Ventilation depends on the Boyle's law, the inverse uh, relationship of pressure and volume. Does anyone have any questions about that mechanics of breathing? We're going to talk about it. So. Um, 
Okay, so respiration is the diffusion of gases across the alve alveolar membrane. Um, it requires an intact circulatory system. So if you're in cardiac arrest, you're not going to be getting respiration even if you're ventilating because you're not going to have blood flow through the alveolus. Um, if you don't have blood flow, you can't have gas exchange. Um, a good thing that this slide denotes is actually what, can, what the air contains. Um, inspired air at sea level is approximately 21% oxygen and 80% nitrogen. And there's a little bit of carbon dioxide in it. And then when you exhale, it's about 16%. In a normal physiologic person, it's about 16% oxygen and 80% nitrogen and 4% carbon dioxide. So the nitrogen concentration doesn't change that much, but the carbon dioxide and the oxygen concentration is what changes. So the majority of the volume of gas that you're breathing is actually nitrogen <coughs> in room air. Um, dead space, which I'll talk about later, is the air, or the, the volume <coughs> of air that is not in the uh, alveolar sacs, or the volume of air that does not have perfusion, that's also dead space. So in a normal physiologic adult, all of us sitting in this room, our dead space is approximately 2 cc <coughs> per kilo, or approximately our, our weight in pounds. So, say an average person is 75 kilos, their dead space is about 150 cc. So if your tidal volume is, if you're breathing in and out 600, 150 of that is not actually participating in oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. This is just a repeat slide of Boyle's law, pressure and volume. This is the law that describes pulmonary ventilation, uh, air flows towards low pressure. So normal expiration is a passive process. Your, your chest wants to collapse, your lungs want to collapse and push the air out. Forced expiration requires energy and is an active process when you want to blow out fast or blow out hard. And normal inspiration is an active process. It requires ATP and energy uh, to expand the chest cavity. It goes against um, all the forces that want to collapse everything. So in inhalation, the diaphragm <coughs> contracts and comes down. The rib cage moves up and out. And that pulls on the exterior portion of the lungs and causes a negative pressure inside the lungs. So air moves in through the airway, the negative pressure in the alveoli. And then exhalation, the diaphragm relaxes and comes back up, and the rib cage settles back down and in, and passively exhale. Questions about that? Which intercostal muscles are inspiratory? External. And internal intercostals are ex ex forced exhalation. So again, this is just another way to look at the respiratory cycle. At end, end exhalation, so at the end of your exhale, the intrapulmonary pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. The air has stopped moving. There's no more equalization that needs to occur. As you begin to inhale, the diaphragm and the thoracic cage move down, up, and out, and creates a negative intrathoracic pressure. The air moves into the upper and lower airways to equalize that pressure. Pressures like to be equalized, so that's, that's why air moves towards the lower pressure. At the end of your inspiration, your intrathoracic pressure equalizes with atmospheric pressure, and again, air movement stops. And then you begin to expire as the thoracic cage returns to a relaxed position. Um, at this point, the intrathoracic <coughs> pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, so the air moves out. Uh, it's all about equalizing the air pressure, airway pressures. Does that make sense? You were talking earlier that it's passive to do the exhale. Mm -hmm. That you're saying the muscles being 
That's for forced exhalation. Like if you want to blow out so birthday candles or. Yeah, so I Otherwise, exhalation is a passive process because the alveoli want to collapse, the rib cage wants to collapse. The muscles pull it up and open, and then you relax those muscles and it comes back down. As the diaphragm relaxes, it, it moves up. Again, another picture of pulmonary circulation in the heart. I think we kind of counted this. You've seen this picture before, and you guys seem to understand it. I can go over it more in detail if you want. Okay, this uh, talks about respiration. So you've got air gas exchange here happening in the alveoli and the lungs. That is respiration. And then it moves through the body, and you get cellular respiration down here, where <coughs> oxygen is offloaded to the tissues, and carbon dioxide moves into the bloodstream to be taken to the lungs to be exhaled. Anyone know where carbon dioxide comes from? It's my product of cell and metabolism. Exactly. The Krebs cycle. Which is important when you start monitoring in tidal CO2. It can be high or low depending on blood flow and cellular metabolism. It's all goofy science stuff. I love it. Oh, okay. Diffusion of oxygen and CO2 across cellular layers obeys Fick's law of diffusion. Anyone know that offhand? Fick's law of diffusion? Uh, we'll talk about it. Movement of gas from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration uh, happens with diffusion. Uh, diffusion is a passive process. Um, it, it moves through membranes. So if you have a high, high amount of oxygen on one side of the membrane and the membrane is permeable, the oxygen wants to equalize between the membranes. <coughs> so it'll move down to the lower concentration, just like airway pressures or gas pressures. Diffusion transfers gases between the lungs and the blood and between the blood and the peripheral tissues. So fixed law of diffusion. The rate of diffusion is dependent on your surface area, like how much uh, capillary surface area you have, either in the lungs or the tissue area. More surface area for the diffusion to happen, the more diffusion is going to happen. Um, the concentration gradient. So if you are just delivering a 21% oxygen, your gradient is going to be lower than if you were delivering 100% oxygen. So um, more oxygen is going to cross the membrane, the more oxygen you deliver. Likewise, you're uh, going to blow off more CO2 if there's more CO2 to blow off, basically. Uh, membrane permeability. So that uh, talks about if the membrane is permeable to the gases or not. Some membranes don't allow diffusion of certain gases. And then membrane thickness. If you have a thick, mem like if you have a really thick membrane versus a single-celled membrane. It's going to take longer to diffuse through the thick membrane than it will the thin membrane. Also, uh, consider mucus here, or fluid. And the alveolus is going to uh, increase your membrane thickness and more layers for the gas to diffuse through. So you're not going to get as much diffusion. So if you have a patient that's in CHF and their alveolus, their lungs are wet, it's going to be hard to oxygenate them because they've got thicker membrane for the gas to diffuse across. <coughs> so the rate of diffusion is dependent on surface area, concentration gradient of your gas, the permeability of whatever membrane you're trying to get the gas through, and how thick that membrane is. Okay, Dalton's Law. This just talks, Dalton's Law says that um, Partial, the partial pressure of whatever gas is in the atmosphere, you add them all up and it totals their total atmosphere pressure. So atmosphere pressure at sea level is 724. <coughs> one tor equals one millimeter of hemoglobin. So because there's more nitrogen in the air, there's more um, pressure of nitrogen in the air. 
and it equals out to our percentages. So um, if you're delivering 100% oxygen, you're going to change this. You're going to have less nitrogen and more oxygen. But it's all going to add up to the same. Uh, basically, all the pieces add up to a whole is what Dalton's, Dalton's law says. Um, this is not your book. Uh, this is kind of a complicated concept. It just talks about that concentration gradient. If, uh, here you have lots of oxygen to dissolve and none, nothing that it's dissolving towards, so it's going to move quickly across that concentration. And as it equalizes out, the um, concentrations become more equal, that gradient is less, and there's less of a desire to move across that membrane, basically. It also, this also shows that um, oxygen, and only 2% of oxygen is dissolved in plasma, 98% are um, attached to the hemoglobin molecules. Whereas more carbon dioxide is more trans, uh, diffusible in liquids, so there's more CO2 in the plasma than there is oxygen. It doesn't really matter. But. Are you going to talk about the oxygen paradox that's greater? Or is it? The oxyhemoglobin curve? Is that? No, like when you have, uh, when you don't have, I guess, I don't know how to say it. When your cells are uh, not working right, you put more oxygen in there, why doesn't it work kind of thing? Yeah, the free radicals, free radicals the, yeah. the increase in the dissolved oxygen when you hyperoxygenate some of mm -hmm. I think it would be that. Mm -hmm. Well, the free radicals of oxygen uh, can cause tissue damage. Is that what you're talking about? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> if you don't realize, it's not on the test, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I will talk a little bit about why you don't give 100% oxygen to everyone and why it's damaging. Okay. Okay. This is just another example of respiration. So here you've got oxygen coming into the bloodstream at the alveoli. Um, your PaO2, or the concentration of oxygen in your arterial blood, is approximately 80 to 100. Comes down here to the tissues, where your tissue oxygen concentration is 40. So there's a huge gradient here for the oxygen to move across into the tissues. And then uh, it equalizes pressure, so your tissue oxygenation is 40, so your after your uh, venous side of the blood should be your oxygen concentration should be about 40 because it likes to equalize. Comes back to the lung, again you have a big concentration gradient, so um, oxygen wants to move in cycle. Same with CO2. Um, you've got a big concentration gradient. Uh, venous CO2 is about 46 compared to 40, so it wants to move out into the alveoli. Um, arterial blood has a lower concentration of CO2, and uh, tissues have a high concentration, so it wants to move across and get exhaled. Normal, I heard you guys did blood gases yesterday. Uh, Ish. They're on a test. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so normal values, arterial blood, PaO2, 80 to 100, CO2, 35, 45, and pH, 735 to 745. Those are considered normal. Venous blood, um, a lot of the ICU intensive stops and some of the ER physicians now are not poking arteries to get samples. They're just going off the venous because it tells you more of what's going on in the tissues anyway. So venous blood gases, uh, O2 normally is about 40. Um, if it's lower than that, either you've got an oxygen delivery problem or you've got a cellular, a ramped up cellular metabolism that's sucking out more oxygen to the tissues. Uh, venous CO2, approximately 46. Again, if it's lower than that, either you're not getting blood supply to the tissues or your metabolism is real low in the tissues, like in hypothermia. Um, if CO2 is elevated, uh, usually it means a lack in blood flow, your, your Krebs cycle and your ATP is still being produced in your tissues, um, but the blood flow is not getting there to pick it up and carry it out. And normal pH of the venous system is 7, approximately 7.37. Seven. Did you say the high venous uh, O2, the PaO2, is indicative of higher tissue metabolism? Is that correct? Because they pretty much equalize every time. 
Yeah, they try to. They try to mm -hmm. So if you've mm -hmm. got 60 there, that means your tissues are more active. Potentially. Potentially. Yes, like, hyper, like uh, malignant hyperthermia, classic example of that, um, where the muscles are contracting, or like somebody who works out, they have to breathe faster and harder because their tissues are creating more CO2. So that's, yeah. Or your tissue metabolism can be going normal, but you're not getting the blood flow like in cardiac arrest. Uh, blood flow stops, so does respiration. So. Um, so you're not delivering the oxygen, so it doesn't It's building up in the tissue. Yeah. So then when you get spontaneous return of circulation, your CO2 goes way up because it's got a whole lot to offload because it wants to equalize. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to talk about, I don't have, this is all I'm going to do to blood gases, but I can try and answer questions if you have any questions about blood gases. So our body only uses 60% from looking at the PaO2, our body only uses 60% of 16%. They, they call that extraction ratio. Yeah, so. Uh, Seems like a lot left over. 40? Yeah. Well, it's, it's extracting over half of what you're carrying in a normal, like that's with you sitting here, not working out, not it just oh, okay. the body laying there. Okay. Um, Somebody who's lifting weights or running, or if the extraction ratio is going to be a lot higher because there's a higher demand of the tissues. Okay. And really, so you can only extract out as much as the concentrating rate. Yeah. Rate equalizes. You can't pull more than that. Mm -hmm. Any ABG blood gas questions? Can I help you with any of that? <laughs> Don't go there. Okay. I think they're fun. <laughs> okay, this is a picture of hemoglobin on the red blood cells. So every red blood cell has these little red, four red heme groups, and that's where 98% of your oxygen is going to attach and get carried through the blood. Um, and as they attach, it actually distorts, changes the structure of all this other, the globin part. Of the, malt, of the cell, um, and that's how it, it kind of distorts and holds on to the oxygen, and then as the concentrati concentration gradient at the tissue changes, it distorts again and offloads the oxygen. So, um, so the percent oxygen saturation is the amount of bound versus unbound themes. So if you're just looking at one cell, if you have three hemes bound, you're going to have a 75% oxygen saturation. Simple as that. If all four are bound, you're going to have 100% oxygen. So oxygen saturation is the uh, O2 content, how much you actually have versus how much you can have. So basically three out of four, you can have the capacity to have four bound hemoglobins, but you only have three. You have three in the content, four in the capacity, times 100 gives you 75%. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. A lot of like, looks at me like, no, but. So this is where sickle cell comes in. Sickle cell, yeah, those okay. uh, Reduces molecules the amount. are uh, not the same. They, they don't bind as well to oxygen. So, maybe I'm way off base. What is my question? When you see on your oxygen saturation device, 98%, it's it's counting how many of these have two or three or four, and then averaging it all together. Average, yeah. So it's millions of these molecules averaged together. So, it's counting all so one of them might not have any bound because it's a dysfunctional hemoglobin, but most of them are going to be mostly bound. So that number is an average of all of these put together. Yes, exactly. Big picture. But this is just one. Thank goodness we have more than one, right? Um, so. That'd be off topic, but when we have someone who, say, they have a carbon dioxide or a down to the suicide attempt in the, uh, the car, carbon monoxide, right? Carbon monoxide, yes. If we still read as oxygen mm -hmm. on our pulse oximeter, but basically bound onto that and it's just it's reading the same gaps, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carbon monoxide has a huge affinity 
for this, more so than oxygen does. So it kicks the oxygen off and then binds to this. And our, I talked about it later today, this morning, the oxygen saturation monitors monitor bound versus unbound. They don't care what it's bound to. So that's why you get all three of Okay, factors affecting oxygen concentrations in the blood. So uh, if you have a decreased red blood cell count or a hemoglobin account, concentration, uh, you're going to have less teams for oxygen to bind to, so you're going to have less molecules of oxygen to actually get delivered to the tissues. You might be 100% saturated on the, molecule, on the hemoglobins that you do have, uh, but overall there's less cars on the train, so there's less delivery. Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, if you have inadequate alveolar ventilation, the oxygen is not getting across the membrane for whatever reason, so you're not going to have as much bound to the hemoglobin. Uh, you can have defective hemoglobin, like you mentioned. Um, you can have decreased diffusion <coughs> across the pulmonary membranes, um, either an increase in diffusion distance or membrane changes. And you can have blood flow, ventilation perfusion mismatch, uh, where you get increased dead space, meaning you've got uh, ventilated alveoli, but there's no blood flow going to those, like in the case of a pulmonary embolism. There's no blood flow, so there's no blood, there's no diffusion. Get ventilation, not respiration. Diffusion distance increase, what would that be? Like uh, uh, fluid or mucus okay. yeah, secretions. Or edema, pulmonary edema. Okay, factors affecting the CO2 concentrations in the blood. Hyperventilation. The more you breathe, the more CO2 you're going to uh, blow off. Increase CO2 production. We alluded to this already with cellular metabolism. If you have a fever, if you have muscular exertion, shivering causes increased CO2 production. Um, and then if you get uh, metabolic acids are produced when there's not, a, uh, not enough oxygen supply to the tissues, the Krebs cycle changes how it makes ATP and produces acids instead of CO2. You can get a VQ mismatch, which is ventilation. Q stands for perfusion. So you can get a mismatch there. Uh, so your cells are still making carbon dioxide um, and they're getting to the lungs, but if there's no interface between the lungs, the blood flow and the alveoli in the lungs, you're not going to be offloading the CO2. So it's going to keep cycling and you're going to build up your CO2 levels. Any respiratory depression? Upper and lower airway obstructive problems and respiratory muscle impairment or disease all lead to VQ mismatch and can increase your CO2 production or increase your CO2 levels. Questions on any of that? Perfusion. So V is ventilation, perfusion is Q. Mm -hmm. Is there a fast answer to? Uh, just, just like hypothermia will decrease it, it's, it increases the, uh, the enzyme activity. The enzyme activity in the cellular, in the Krebs cycle, increases. Okay. Moves, it's easier to move with heat, um, and then you can slow down metabolism by cooling someone off. Okay. Regulation of respiration. So the respiratory rate can be, uh, normally is involuntary control. We don't voluntarily think, okay, I need to breathe in and breathe out. But it can be overridden um, by voluntary control. And overall, it's controlled by chemical and mechanical mechanisms that provide involuntary impulses and feedback systems uh, in the, for, to create respiratory hemostasis. The body likes to have hemostasis. So um, it's got all sorts of mechanisms to involuntarily tell you to breathe faster or harder or less. There's sensors in the body. There's chemo and mechanical uh, sensors. The chemo, chemo receptors are peripherally in the carotid bodies in your neck. Um, those detect low oxygen levels. Um, and if the oxygen level is low, it sends a signal to your brain to breathe more. 
bigger, deeper breaths. And then there's um, central chemoreceptors in your brain that detect carbon dioxide levels. Um, if, you're, if the CSF, the fluid in your brain becomes more acidotic, it um, switches on a signal to tell your brain to breathe faster and uh, deeper. Mechanical stretch receptors are in the lungs. As your lungs expand, these stretch, stretch receptors get stimulated. And um, it's like a feedback loop. If they get stretched and stimulated, it tells your brain to stop ins inspiring. And that's actually called the her herring brewer reflex. And that's mentioned in another slide. Uh, so central control of respiration happens in the brainstem. The main central brainstem control is in the medulla. Um, the pons is a little bit lower in the brainstem, and it's kind of your backup system to the breathing regulation. So normally right now, all this that in the room, the medulla is what's controlling our drive to breathe. Um, and that's where most of the feedback comes from, from the peripheral and mechanical chemoreceptors that go to the medulla to tell the medulla how it needs to breathe. The pons is when you get brain damage, and medulla is damaged and not doing its job. The pons kind of kick <laughs> That doesn't happen in the hospital. Okay, so the pons is the backup system. That's where you're going to get your irregular breathing patterns that you see with brain damaged people. And I'll go over that later. What? Huh? Okay, so the pons is the backup system. That's where you're going to get like the chain stokes and the Kuzmal's respiratory patterns comes from the pons. Um, what's that? I was awake. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then um, part of the feedback system, the medulla sends signals to our respiratory muscles, and that's how we get the increased rate and depth of breathing activity. Okay, so I talked about chemoreceptors, uh, carotid bodies, and the arch of the aorta, and the medulla. Um, they get stimulated by low oxygen levels and, in, and increased CO2 levels or a decreased pH. Basically, um, it just wants to equalize every, everything in your blood. The cerebral spinal fluid pH is the primary controller of the medulla and pons respiratory center. That is because um, CO2 uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier easily, so that's why whereas oxygen has a harder time crossing that barrier. So that's why the CO, there's free floating CO2 in the CSF basically, dissolved in the CSF, uh, where oxygen doesn't dissolve e easily in the fluids. So. And then here's the herring grower reflex, prevents overexpansion of the lung. Uh, as the lung stretch receptors get kicked on, it stops the expansion of lung. You can override this with an amber bag. I've done that before. With what? Amber bag or an uh, anesthesia bag. You can give them a huge, huge breath. I'll do it for lung recruitment sometimes, and it just opens up their lungs completely. But then they don't want to breathe for a while because their brain says they don't have enough. The hypoxic drive to breathe is a profound <coughs> stimulus in normal uh, normal individuals. If we have low oxygen levels, we want to breathe. We want that oxygen. Uh, hypoxic drive increases respiratory stimulation in people with chronic respiratory disease also, but it's at a lower rate. So COPDers, um, their drive to breathe, if you give them 100% oxygen, their body's not used to that, so they don't breathe. It'll turn off their drive to breathe. You have to be careful with that. Yes. Yeah. That's why they tell you just to give them enough oxygen to keep them 90 to 94 COPDers. 
And they usually know. They usually know where they're at, yeah. Um, so the main respiratory center is the medulla, like I said. Uh, the medulla um, sends impulses to the um, respiratory system. It tells it to breathe or not breathe. The apneustic center in the pons assumes respiratory control if the medulla fails to initiate a response. And then the pneumotaxic center is a network of neurons located in the pons that assist in controlling the respiratory. So the goal of respiration is to maintain normal levels of arterial oxygenation, uh, carbon dioxide levels, and pH. It's just a feedback loop, which is what this shows. The central controller is the brainstem. Um, the brainstem sends signals to the respiratory muscles, and then the peripheral and central chemo and stretch receptors send signals back to the pons. And it's a constant feedback loop. It's constantly adjusting to the pH and CO2 and oxygen levels in your blood. Things that we do to disrupt this, <coughs> our drugs are a huge disruptor to this. Our paralytics stop muscle. So pharmacology that we give, and sometimes the uh, injury that the patient comes with disrupts the cycle. And that's when we have to take over and manually maintain the cycle for them. So normal respiratory rates in adult 12 to 20, child 18 to 24, and infants are 40 to 60. Which is a lot if you think about it. So when you're bagging an adult, it's about one breath every three seconds. A child is about a breath every two seconds. A little less than that. And an infant is almost one, one every second. Tiny little breaths. So things that increase your respiratory rate, fever, emotions, pain, hypoxia, acidosis, and stimulants, and things that decrease your respiratory rate are depressants, narcotics, and sleep. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Lung volumes. I've studied this chart for hours, so I would spend some time on it, just making sense of it. So the zero to 6,000 indicates an adult lung, how much volume, if you were to completely fill the lung, how much volume it would take. And that is called your total lung capacity down here. Our normal tidal volume is this red line. That's not, you're sitting right here and you're just breathing. And it's on average, this says it's like 700, 800 or so. No, it's about 500 in an adult. I would say the average is three to three to 600 in an adult uh, tidal volume. Um, the expiratory reserve volume is if you were to forcefully exhale all the air you possibly could out of your lungs, you would get down to this line. And there's always going to be some residual volume left in your lungs after your forceful ex exhalation. That is because some of the alve alveoli won't collapse, but the, um, the airways to them collapse. Um, so there's air trapping in there. Uh, inspiratory reserve volume is what you can give uh, beyond your normal tidal volume, how big of a breath you can take. Normally, because of the herring brower reflex, you're not going to get all the way up to max capacity. It'll um, involuntarily stop your inspiration before you can get to max capacity. <coughs> your vital capacity uh, is basically what you can forcefully do. Force exhalation versus force inhalation. And that's forced as in like you're bagging them, or like us, like us. deliberately yeah. taking them. This is, yeah, this is us. We want to mimic this when we take over breathing for a patient, but this is like what a person can do physiologically on their own. Another important thing to note is we're breathing up here, and we've got about 2,500 cc's of volume already in our lungs, and we're breathing our tidal volumes on top of that. So that's what keeps these alveoli open. It takes about that much volume just to hold the alveoli open and 
Okay, I'm going to leave that up because I'm going to talk about each of these again. The next several slides are just talking about these. So tidal volume, like I said, is 5 to 7 cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. Men are going to have a higher tidal volume on large, tall people um, than smaller people or women. Do you want me to go over them again, or you guys can read it? Yes? Talk about it, or not? Can we on the test? Uh, <laughs> potentially. I think if you study this chart, and then just, these are basically definitions that I just gave you. Um, Alveolar volume is the amount of gas moved in and out of the respiratory tract in one minute. <coughs> so a minute ventilation is your tidal volume. So the V is volume, minute is minute, or min is minute. Volume tidal here, so how big your tidal volume is, time respiratory rate, is your minute ventilation. Your minute ventilation is what determines your uh, PaCO2 levels. So if your minute ventilation increases, your CO2 levels drop. If your minute ventilation decreases, your CO2 levels are going to decline. Make sense? So if you have uh, a traumatic brain injury that you think has elevated ICPs, one of the things you can do to drop the ICP is decrease the carbon dioxide level in their blood because it shrinks down the blood vessels in their brain. You can increase your tidal volume and your rate. You're going to get more bang for your buck, though, increasing your rate because It's, um, it's basically a longer train versus a lot of shorter trains. You're going to get uh, more delivery of CO2 by a lot of shorter trains than one long train. It takes a long time to, to offload. So you want to blow off CO2, increase your respiratory rate, basically. So your alveolar minute ventilation, minute volume, is the actual air that reaches the alveoli for gas exchange. And it's less because of dead space. So dead space, again, is the volume of air which is inhaled but does not take part in gas exchange. It's the air that's in our upper airway and our trachea and our bronchioles, not the air that's, not the air that's in the alveolar sacs. It's also the air that's in the alveolar sacs that have no uh, perfusion. And then here's... In a normal physiologic lung, dead space is approximately 2 cc's per kilo of ideal body weight, or their weight in pounds. Make sense to everyone? Okay, respiratory problems. 